Cutzler YMX uses the Netrodyne two-way camera system in all of our power units. The Netrodyne cameras have, have more than once um, exonerated a driver who was perceived to be at fault, as well as saved our Cutzler YMX from paying damages related to an accident. We are already seeing just in one year of Netrodyne the impact of better safety scores and fewer damages and incidents in our insurance rates. And welcome to the Halloween edition of Freightonomics. I've got on my costume. I was just say, like, glad you dressed up today. Yeah. Tony, you've got on yours. Uh, and, you know, the freight market itself, we're ending the month of October on, I don't know if it's a strange note <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or a spooky note, but it is ending today. It It is, I think positive signs that I wouldn't call spooky and <laughs> unless you're... I mean, of depends on who you're looking at. A lot of optimism from uh, some of these earnings reports. We'll talk to those here in a minute. Werner, of course, Derek Leather's coming out being probably the most bullish, but mm -hmm. he doesn't want to be called bullish. Yeah. Uh, and then we also have XPO, which did Strong. fantastic, extremely well. well. We'll break that down a little bit. Some of that's in the acquisitions, but uh, I think overall they, their operational efficiency was quite strong. Uh, but before we get to that, Zach Strickland, Head of Market Intelligence, Tony Mulvey, Senior Analyst. Uh, we are going to talk about the freight market and the macroeconomics uh, environment. We had a big economic release this week that yeah. we'll get to in just a second. But first and foremost, let us thank our sponsor. Yes. So remove the guesswork from driver management and fleet safety and start predicting your accident reduction cost savings. Netrodyne's AI-enabled video safety platform corrects unsafe driving habits, recognizing and reinforcing great driving. With the Green Zone score, your fleet of engaged drivers will protect your bottom line. Every 50 basis or 50 points earned is a 14% cut to your accident rate. So thank you, Netrodyne, for, you know, continued sponsorship. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the driver environment right now, of course, we're seeing owner operators leave the space. Yeah. Uh, large fleets, we're seeing them still contract. But I think there's never, you know, we talk about the driver shortage industry wide. That's kind of the term that's been used, but it's really more about driver recruitment. And of course, and, if you want to see this debated on stage, John Larkin, of course, will be doing this at F3 yeah. here in a few weeks. Um, but I think driver retention is always one of the most critical things. I mean, you're, you're talking about you have 100% turnover mm -hmm. and that's that's commonplace in a year. Yeah. So improving the environment for the drivers is, of course, even in an up or a down cycle, doesn't matter. It's always important. Yeah. Especially high quality ones. Oh, thousand percent. But Zach, as we we talk about this and before we get to the economic news, mm -hmm. we need to set the stage on where the market is in the current environment. And what better way to do that than a market in two? I got two minutes for you. Are you ready? Yeah. In three, two, one. All right. We're going to talk about this chart a little bit more later, especially as we talk about Warner's earnings. This is the tender rejection index over the last year. The higher it goes, the tighter the market. Prices go up, typically. We're still in a very subdued space. Tender rejection rates are hovering in this 5% range. We had a big dip yesterday uh, in the tender rejection rate, but it's still 5.2%. That is still relatively elevated and much more elevated than it was at this point last year. So, you know, the, the expectation here is that this is going to go up as we hit November, December, and some of this peak season value. So the market vulnerability that was created by the ILA strike and Hurricane Milton is starting to, it's it's resilient. It's kind of holding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's resilient. So let's go to the next chart, talk about demand for a hot minute here. Demand remaining relatively strong throughout the month of October, tender volumes for the current year in white, uh, you know, year over year growth, still present and str strongly present at that, still flashing a bullish signal here in overall demand. Let's go to the next chart. Spot versus contract. It is bid season. Uh, and we hear a lot about this in the earnings calls. So this is going to be yet another important chart to talk about. Spot rates are now relatively flat uh, from a year over year perspective. We've got a little bit of a notch here moving higher. Uh, they're starting to show signs of moving higher, but I don't know that there's a strong amount of pressure because you look at the spot rate below that. They're still operating at a strong discount. 
but the floor of the market is rising underneath it with the NTIL, which is excluding the influence of fuel overall. So bottom of the market coming higher, the contract market staying relatively stable for the moment. That is actually a, an interesting development if you read my chart of the week. Uh, Ontario market coming up last but not least. This is the market, if you watch nothing else, watch Ontario Southern California demand, which is what you're seeing there in the white. Tender volumes for Ontario still very strong. And rejection rates just starting to percolate here. Yeah. This is this the Southern California market. If you if you hear nothing else, this is the kind of the Market. The middle of the market. Yeah. This market is where everything watch. happens. Yeah. It's the market to watch, no doubt. Largest market in the country by far. I think it's what four and a half percent of total outbound volume comes from Ontario. Yeah. And it's the largest market, single market in the country. And if you look at the, the aggregation. If you look at LA in that same vein, right? Just look, bunch them together. I mean, you're talking what, seven, eight percent of total volume in the in the country comes yeah. out of out of Southern California from the truckload perspective, I think it, it's extremely impactful. I think one of the things that's interesting is you didn't see tender rejection rates fall down during like the middle part of this month. I think it was aided by Milton. Mm -hmm. I think if we pull that chart back up, just looking at Oh, try. Yeah. It, it came down a little, but it's held above 5% the entire month. Typically, what you would see seasonally is a decline through October into the middle of November, and then it starts to pick up ahead of the holidays. Well, we're at a higher base. We've set the baseline now higher yeah. moving into the holidays, which to me is a signal that, hey, this thing... This is a very it, slow draw higher, Like by yeah. the way. I think this is something that's important to note is that it's not been a strong moving market by any means yeah. like it's it's been a very subtle increase over time even with the hurricane even with the ila influence we're still in a very slow moving environment a thousand percent so i think uh you know i want to talk about this is kind of an added an additional thing to watch for over the last bit i've got a couple of charts here that i just wanted to call out you know i ended the market in two with ontario volumes demand uh and the tender rejection rate but this intermodal component to the market has been increasingly important, and I don't think that it's talked about enough. I'm, you're looking at outbound loaded container volumes out of Los Angeles uh, for both international and domestic total, and I'm, uh, I pulled up inbound empty container moves. We can't really see this mechanism in the truckload market. We can't see yeah. empty trucks coming back into Los Angeles, which is keeping those rejection rates lower because mm -hmm. there is a natural over there, you know, there's much more freight leaving Los Angeles than coming into it. Yeah. We can't see this mechanism in trucks, but we sure can see it in the containers on the rails because that inbound dip there in the orange line, this is inbound empty containers. These are largely internationals. Mm -hmm. uh, so the 20 and 40 foot stuff that moves across the water in the ocean has dropped off significantly. Now, Mike Bowden Distel and I have had a lot of conversations about this. And it, and it looks like there is a, this means, this is a signal that the carriers, the ocean carriers, which operate these containers, are keeping this closer to the ports. Yeah, I think to me, it's a sign that they're going to need these containers back. They have a belief that they're going to need the containers back overseas faster than what they've needed in the past. Yeah. Whether that's a solid, I mean, to me, that seems like an upstream demand cycle looks positive. Now, the question is going to be, do they actually and just yeah. demand? I mean, I guess well, look at this demand. Yeah. Look at this year over year growth in container volume demand intermodal. Yeah. This is what's helping keep truckload capacity very soft. It's what's helping keep th rates relatively subdued. And if you're talking about the potential that they're not going to have containers or they're going to hold these containers, not allow them to go yeah. inland, that's a significant reduction in capacity. Yeah, that's been kind of a safety valve, right? Or relief valve for the market where this demand has gone via rail, yeah. staying in the international container, headed inland to Chicago yep. and Dallas, and then moves from there. It's got to go somewhere, right? If yeah. it's not going that way, it's going to get translated, whether it goes domestic, intermodal, which right. time is running out for that, mm -hmm. or it's going to flow into the truckload market. And I mean, the way I see it, that that's a positive sign, again, for Southern California yep. freight volumes to to move higher from here. Remember, you just said Southern California. I'm going to pull up this one more chart uh, before I get to some fun with Excel. Uh, and let's look at the container rates 
that are moving from China's China to North America's West Coast uh, and East Coasts. So in the white line, that's China, to North America, East. Guess what? It takes about 15 to 16 more days to go to the East Coast yeah. from China. And yet the interesting component of this is that that rate is lower. Yeah. Than going to the east, the west coast. Uh, to me, one, it's a signal that the ocean carriers set the market to some degree, right? They're, I mean, they have vessels that are going there. They're dropping the rate to to capture any demand. I would think mm -hmm. one, and any freight moving to that that coast isn't likely to make it by the peak uh, yeah. here on the retail side. So it's kind of not an option. So I think you're seeing, but I think these reductions overall are interesting. I, to me, I. I got brought this question this week and it's like, what do ocean contract rates look like in 2025? And I was like, well, to me, it kind of depends on when they were negotiated for 2024. If they were negotiated at the end of 2023 for 2024, they're likely higher yep. in, in 2025. If they were negotiated in the middle of the year, they might be lower than where they were come 2025. So I think it's just the, dependent on timing. I think what's interesting is for the first time really in the data set. I mean, even if you went back, you've had what, a few we um call it ten days or so where the the spot rate has been to the east coast has been lower than the mm -hmm. west coast. Yeah. I think it's I think to me it's kind of telling on the well, well, West Coast is is still demand into the West Coast is still yeah, fairly I think strong. You had this pull forward uh effect as well as you had these shippers basically staying away from the East Coast after the strike occurred. Yeah. And they continue to have that behavior and it's leaving these gaps on these boats. Now, the important thing for domestic operators and shippers to know is that there is, this is a signal that there is a significant amount of freight either heading into the West Coast or that is already there mm -hmm. that is ready for this fourth quarter peak season. Yeah. If this gets unleashed and if you remember the chart from Ontario, Volume is already up significantly yeah. for the truckload market. The intermodal component, we'd, we're losing that viability into mm -hmm. the fourth quarter because of the natural tendency, because service uh, you know, is, is less viable for that. And then we have less empties. Well, and I'll, I want to look at this. You look at the rejection rates below the national average. Yeah. It wasn't during the summer, right? It was right. The, kind of the signal. It being below that leaves other areas exposed. Yeah. I think that's They're running my take to Los away. Angeles yeah. to cover that freight. Yeah. They know it's coming out. They know. I mean, if you start looking at what's interesting is mm -hmm. if you look at like spot rates, they've moved higher yep. out of California along some of the denser lanes. Mm -hmm. They know that the freight is, it's kind of more time sensitive right yep. now. There's some sense of urgency to move that freight now, at this point to get it on shelves by the time it needs to. Mm-hmm. So rates are fairly healthy going out there. Mm -hmm. Guess what? I mean, they're willing to go out there. They're clearly accepting any freight out of the market. I mean, you're talking, what, yep. sub 4% rejection rate. Exactly. It's going to leave areas of the country exposed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you, you see LA kind of heat up and it, it leaves these pockets yeah. of exposure. And if you're not ready for them, if you're shipping goods, say out of Chicago, out of Dallas, out of the Pacific Northwest, especially right now, mm -hmm. like, it's going to end up costing you more than what it has in the past. Yeah. Over the last week, and I, I looked at this in the rejection rates, mm -hmm. week over week rejection rate increases. Every single region of the United States for drive in uh, had an increase except for the Midwest. And that was that was a marginal one yeah. at that. So Midwest, of course, the largest region, the way that we aggregate it internally. Yeah. But um, it's all over the place, which is, you know, we've got this demand coming out of Southern California, which is traditionally long haul freight. Yeah. It goes at least to the middle of the country, Dallas and Chicago. Yeah. I mean, there's not many consumption yep. centers in between LA and Dallas. I mean, you've got Denver and you've got Las Vegas. Las Vegas is fairly Salt short. City. Denver, Salt Lake City. I mean, you're still talking, mm -hmm. what, 800 to 1,000 yeah. miles or more from so from Southern California, it's still long haul freight, right? Like that's a lot of capacity. It's it takes more uh, capacity to haul from Los Angeles to Chicago than it does from Chicago somewhere else. Chicago to Atlanta, <laughs> or Atlanta to the Northeast. Like so, there there's a lot of capacity at stake here. So let's move on 
Let's give a quick bull and bear look uh, with some fun with Excel. Uh, I got a chart here. You saw it last week. I trimmed it down a little bit and I also labeled it because <laughs> I realized that not everybody understands the, you know, if you want to screenshot this or whatever, now you'll know what these are and what they're measuring. And of course, I put a category on there, capacity, demand, or rates. Those are the three categories that they're measuring. Uh, week over week, the trend lines are largely up, but we're about just above 50% mm -hmm. on all the week over week trends for truckload, van, reefer, maritime, and intermodal. Uh, still quite bullish in the intermodal sector. Uh, in turn, uh, the spot rates for intermodal moving down a little bit week over week, but I don't think that is significant. Uh, yeah. Still, I would I would stay like, why are you doing this? <laughs> again, it it's a to me again it shows to it's a volume mm -hmm. capture market share capture. Might be game. some balancing issue. Yeah, that as well. So I, I think I look at it and you see van rejections up, yep. van volumes up, rates basically flat mm -hmm. uh, week over week, slightly I mean, what down a couple mm -hmm. pennies. Uh, I wouldn't read too much into that. Mm -hmm. uh, everything on this especially from the van side, tells me that hey, bullish, to, bullish, especially heading into 2025. Yeah, bullish signals. And look at the annual trends there. All green except for about four. <laughs> yeah. uh, the spot rates for intermodal, contract rates for reefer, which are extremely volatile and I, I, somewhat seasonal. To me, uh, the one that stands out, van contract rates up 1% week over week. Yeah. If you looked at them quarterly, they were up third quarter from the second quarter. To me, it's a signal 2025... If yeah. you're looking at contract rates, they're going to be flat to higher, not lower. Exactly. When uh, and I think that's the takeaway is like if you're expecting cost decreases and or rate decreases in contract rates, you're going to you're going to be you're going to be you're serious. going to have a bad day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's the best way to phrase it. All right. Well, let's get into some of these stories real quick. Also, talk about GDP. Yeah, I mean, it missed expectations. Yeah. Grew at two point eight mm -hmm. percent year over year. Uh, I think one of the it's consumer spending. That's still, still a decent figure, by it's the way. Strong growth. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. growing in That's excess. That's actually right around the target. <laughs> yeah, it's growing in excess of what the long-term target for yeah. inflation is. I, yeah. And that's what you want. You want the economy to grow at a faster rate than inflation. I think the takeaways, though, imports up 11.2% in the third quarter. That is a net detractor from, from GDP, GDP, but it is a strong indicator for freight movements. Yeah. And I, I think that's the part that often gets confused is like, Net exports, so export growth even yeah. is a net gain right. for, but that's also a freight movement. So to me, it's a signal, hey, things are coming into the country. Things are still going out at an elevated rate to what they were this time last year. And that is strong for freight that's demand. That's why freight demand freight you're demand seeing. has got some, some bullish signals underneath yeah. it uh, specifically. Uh, and of course, you know, Maybe I, here in the next day or so, we might be having a debate with Craig Fuller, our CEO, about the tariffs and the election yeah. and all sorts of fun stuff here in the next day. So stay tuned for that, as I know that's top of mind for a lot of people, especially Absolutely. heading into next week. Uh, but first, let's go into our next. Let's go into the news anomics, the stories yeah. of the day, because I think, you know, I like to read these earnings reports, get a little bit of flavor from what the sentiment is from the CEOs and some of the C-suite executives, but also getting into their fundamental data a little bit, the financial statements. I read those because I like numbers and that's what I did. It's data, right? It's uh, actual data. And, and I think my big takeaway. So Werner, basically their first look, the biggest thing that I took away from this, from the earnings statement and everything was... They have reduced their equipment, <laughs> yeah. like trucks down uh, significantly on on all of their segments here in terms yep. of one way truck load, their total operating equipment down. Capacity is exiting the market through the larger fleets. <laughs> yeah, which is what I mean, to me, that's the signal that everybody's feeling it and making mm -hmm. the thing. I mean, it's almost like a difference between where we were kind of in 20, we'll call it 2018 into 2019, like they over ordered equipment right now it. That's not necessarily the case. Like they're reducing their fleet. They haven't, they're not growing and they didn't really grow at the rate that they did in yeah. past cycles. Well, look at the dedicated. The dedicated yeah. is down 8.4%. Which is. And that's the, that's the, this to me is kind of a proxy for private fleets. Yeah. Like if the truckload service providers are removing their dedicated equipment, which is the true guaranteed capacity component yeah. of an operation. Yeah, it's like a true contract versus Guess what contract. some of these non-transportation companies 
are doing. Reducing their fleet. They're but. probably getting to that point where they realize they should not be supportive of, of trucks that don't move anywhere. Uh, so that's the big takeaway from that one. Uh, and then we have another article here. Horner CEO stands out for optimistic trucking market outlook. Uh, basically, the you know Derek Leather says, there is an ongoing kind of subtle tightening taking place. So I don't want to call our shot just yet because I'd like to understand just how much tighter it gets as we go through this peak season. That's kind of the conservative way of saying, I feel pretty good. <laughs> that the market's tightening. That the market's tightening. Now, if you look at the, the OTRI chart here, you know, this is going to be the year over year over year view. <laughs> uh, 2019 in orange, and then last year in that teal bluish. Look at that subtle tightening. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you followed that blue line from May of 2023 and then into the white line into this year, that's exactly what he just said. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a very subtle tightening. Now, his last comment here, I don't want to read I don't want the read through to be that I'm bullish on the fourth quarter, he said. I can't speak to where others are coming from, but what I know is that our customer base we believe we're going to have both a price and volume incremental life this peak season compared to last. I.e. Not a hard statement. That's not a big statement. Yeah. <laughs> I.e. Peak season, just, there's some seasonality that's mm -hmm. going to show up. I think it it, echo, it echoes the sentiment that normal seasonality is returning that Shelly Simpson had, yep. what, last week yep. uh, or, or two weeks ago now? I, they all run start running together in terms of the calendar. But I think... It, I th I think when you start looking at it, you look at spot rates. If you put the NTIL, mm -hmm. the lows are higher. Mm -hmm. The highs maybe aren't higher. Yeah. Not yet, but you're setting up for the market is moving in a direction where, again, 2025 seems favorable. If you look, I mean, the other read through mm -hmm. in this is you start looking at everybody else that's right. reported from the truckload side, like, they're being more disciplined in terms of their pricing and turning down, away volume. Turning down volume. Uh, it's no longer a volume game. Nope. Uh, and I think it becomes because they know they can't operate mm -hmm. in in an environment where rates are so low that they're losing money significantly on everything. Like they'd rather at the expense of some asset utilization, they would rather turn away volume. That well, they're, they're reducing their capacity at this point also, instead of taking new business. Yeah. That's that's what I read is yeah. they're reducing capacity instead of taking new business, therefore in inflating rates. Now, the next earnings report that I want to talk about, Hub Group's total revenue down on a weak Q3 market. The intermodal sector may be like late to the game in terms of incorporating this strategy. The truckload operators are like, look, this is no longer a market share play for us. We're going to not price things lower significantly. We're going to reduce our own capacity. Intermodal sector has not done that. Mm -hmm. uh, Hub Group, of course, having they're seeing this reflected in their earnings. Uh, revenue is impacted by lower revenue per load in the company's intermodal and brokerage segment. So they are pricing. They're having to drop rates to get volume. Yeah. And the chart that I have here to explain how this works is intermodal contract rates in yellow and the intermodal demand there in white. Look at that volume growth in the third quarter. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty strong year over year Q3 growth. And yet the prices obviously have not matched this. They were actually down and I've only started to inch higher here in the last month or so. Yeah. And then you, I mean, you look at, you've had the other chart, right? Mm -hmm. Where you look at intermodal spot rates and like they're not yep. competitive at all, the trucking, but it, it's a, again, a volume, a market share gain. Mm -hmm. I, I think if you... I think one of the quotes that came out of it, it's from Hub Group, is mm -hmm. thinking some pull forward in demand mm -hmm. from Q4 into Q3. Yep. So moderating their Q4 outlook slightly, but still expecting low double digit growth in Q4. Yeah. I mean, you're still talking. Still We're talking 10% increases. You're still increases. talking bullish demand. So, and then kind of going back into what we saw in that inbound empty into LA, mm -hmm. some some disruption in the international intermodal sector yeah. could help the domestic intermodal players. Well, you look at intermodal volume still out of LA, outbound, strong, inbound container volumes down, right? almost primarily in the international side. Guess mm -hmm. what? I mean, it's a that is a positive signal if you are an inter yeah. intermodal marketing company like a Hub Group or JB Hunt that operates those. You have Snyder some that has some... Intermo a 
large intermodal sector. Lock in your prices now. If you're a shipper and intermodal, you've got room to move. Yeah. You got room to move on those prices, I think. Uh that is that is taking on. I think the market share play, uh, you know, it feels like it's, it's kind of come and gone a little bit. Yeah. Um, last one I want to touch on real quick, XPO, LTL company, formerly of uh, you know, <laughs> all the conglomerate it was RXO, XPO, XPO, yeah, all of that. Uh, they showed a tremendous, strong year-over-year -year, uh, growth. Their OR was down, which is a positive sign. They had some acquisitions. Uh, their tonnage and shipments were down, but their revenue was up slightly. Mm -hmm. So there's some pricing mixing going on here. So yeah. they, they've actually seen some decent growth uh, in their pricing. And I think this is a pretty big one to look at because the other LTL carriers didn't report such good growth. Well, I think the one that stands out is you look at adjusted operating ratio. 200 basis point improvement year over year to 84 mm percent -hmm. versus some of the other ltl carriers that saw degradation in their or so yeah. not only you saw some revenue growth but they improved their efficiency versus mm -hmm. some of the L other ltl carriers that that right. weren't able to capture that yeah exactly well hopefully everybody has a good halloween Freight 